we will get started right away. There's a lot to cover, uh, a lot to cover. And there's a lot that's been happening uh, in the world over the last several weeks. And we have to be prepared for it. If you're on the first time on this ministry, uh, there's something I want to address that if you have not seen the previous videos that we have put out or the live streams that we've had, then you're not going to realize that this ministry is a Christ-centered, Bible-based, Holy Spirit-directed ministry. We know, make no qualms about that, and we are not trying to hide it. We are also not trying to hide the fact that we are Seventh-day Adventists. We're born in Britain. I'm a third-generation Seventh-day Adventist. But I also believe the Shepherd's Rod message. If that's a problem for you, I understand. Uh, but what we're trying to do is be mature enough as Christians to be able to sit down and reason together and rightly divide God's truth. And that's what we've been doing with Pastor Carlton Knott. He's put out a series of videos. And the reason why this ministry is called, the, oh, not the ministry, but this series is called Destroying the Shepherd's Rod, Many people don't see the question mark at the end. There's a question mark there. And that question mark is trying to get you to understand that we're looking at, is it possible to destroy a message which we believe the Lord has sent for not only some of the Adventist church, but for the entire world? Family, we're in trouble. If you don't realize that, if you're some of the Adventists, realize that the world is in trouble, church is in trouble, families are in trouble, a lot of trouble that's going on. And we can see that the last days are wrapping up. And if the Lord has not sent something to us to warn us and to get us prepared for his coming, then what God are we serving? Who do we serve? So let's understand that. And as we go into this, we're responding today to Carlton Knott's, Pastor Carlton Knott, he said that the kingdom, the premillennial kingdom, is deadly heresy. It's a product of fancy. It has no basis in the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, or anywhere in Scripture. And if you haven't seen those videos, Kingdom Part 1 and 2, I suggest you go and see them. Because we address that leading up to this presentation. Because for this presentation and the next, and probably the third, we're going to deal 100% with what the scriptures say about the kingdom that the shepherd's rod message highlights. And again, we've said that this is a learning ministry as well as a teaching ministry. We put it out there so that if someone, anyone, any pastor, any doctorate, any whoever it is, scholar, as we present the information, if it is incorrect, because what pastor not presented so far certainly has not destroyed the shepherd. Certainly hasn't, right? If it's there and they want to come on, we'll give them the whole time. We'll give them the two hours because we're only on for two hours. We'll give them the time. And we, we have no problem with that. And we'll answer. And if what they per, um, present is biblically based, it is written, we'll change. We'll say the chapter right message is wrong. We're not trying to be right necessarily. We're trying to be saved, just like all of you are. That's why you're here. You're, you're, you're open to listen and you, you say, let me sit down and listen and see whether or not, um, you know, what is being said is biblically based. And that's what we're doing here. And that's what our purpose is. So uh, before we actually uh, start, I just want to say, just listen. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist who's just come, come here for the first time, just listen. Because we're going to go over the kingdom. And there's a lot of information and we're trying to give it to you as concisely as we possibly can. But you don't have to worry about writing anything down right now. When you listen to the recording, you'll be able to write down whatever it is you need to write down. All right? So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, please listen intently. Very important to do that. Turn up your speakers if you need to. And um, you will be able to see my screen just about right now. This is our prayer thought. 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He hath shown thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? Now, we use this for our prayer thought because Micah 6, 9 is very important to these last days because verse 9 says, hear ye the rod. And as we've said before, if the shepherd's rod message is not the rod that the Lord is requiring us to hear or asking or, or encouraging us to hear, then we're open to find out what it is. As a matter of fact, today on YouTube, I saw that a ministry came out, Bob Jones Ministry. It says, uh, 2023, the shepherd's rod. Now, they're not Adventists, they're Sunday keepers. And by the way, I would uh, uh, encourage you all to, to invite your, your Adventist family members here to come and listen in a very uh, safe environment. Nobody has to know that you're listening, no, nothing like that. But this is what this is for, to expose the Shepherd's Rod message to our Adventist brethren and have a conversation with them. But uh, Bob Jones put that out. And so now people can ask themselves, well, is that the rod that the Lord has access to here? Whatever rod it is, we need to hear it. If it's not this shepherd's rod that, that we, we're bringing to you that was uh, brought to us by the, the, the Lord's servant, V.T. Harder, then we're open to listen to whatever rod it is. But that's what the Lord is asking us to hear. Let's get an a, a additional prayer thought from Sister Delisa as she reads from Great Controversy, page 343 and 344. No truth is more clearly taught in the Bible than that God, by his Holy Spirit, especially directs his servants on earth in the great movements for the carrying forward of the work of salvation. Men are instruments in the hand of God, employed by him to accomplish his purposes of grace and mercy. Each has his part to act. To each is granted a measure of life adapted to the necessities of his time and sufficient to enable him to perform the work which God has given him to do. But no man, however honored of heaven, has ever attained to a full understanding of the great plan of redemption, or even to a perfect appreciation of the divine purpose in the work for his own time. Men do not fully understand what God would accomplish by the work which he gives them to do. They do not comprehend in all its bearings the message which they utter in his name. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Even the prophets, who were favored with the special illumination of the Spirit, did not fully comprehend the import of the revelations committed to them. The meaning was to be unfolded from age to age, as the people of God should need the instruction therein contained. So, family, what does that mean? That means that there was no prophet, there has been no prophet that has had a complete understanding of the plan of redemption from beginning to end. That includes Sister White, that includes V.T. Hadif, that includes all the prophets. So if you expect, as Pastor Nott has said, that the premillennial kingdom is not found in spirit of prophecy, and we see it nowhere in the Bible, if you expect that Sister White would have all the understanding of the plan of redemption, then you're doing something that she never even, she never even thought. And that the scriptures don't support that at all. 
The Lord is always revealing his message. The plan of redemption is progressive. It is not stagnant. And if you expect it to be stagnant, you're serving the wrong God because he gives us information as we can handle it. You can't handle all the information. None of us can. So the Lord gives it to us a little bit at a time. What the, what the disciples believed when they were alive, we, don't, we, we believe the same thing, but the Lord couldn't give them the entire truth because, again, it can't handle it. So keep that in mind as you study the topics that Pastor Knott says he's going to expose the rod for, and we're going to go in in-depth every single subject. We're not going to leave any stone unturned turn, so that you will know what you believe, believe what you know, and if the rod is wrong, you'll be able to come back to us and say, rod is wrong, and you can show us by it is written, and we're open with that. We're good with that. No problem whatsoever. So keep that in mind as we study this very important topic, because it's going to uh, be very crucial to your understanding of this particular topic at this time. So let's have a word of prayer. And I invite the Lord's presence to be with us as we go into this very important subject. Dear Heavenly Father, come before thy merciful throne on this beautiful Sabbath day in the midst of the land. And we pray that your spirit may be with us, be with us as we speak, because we're also listening. Touch our tongues so that we only speak what you would have us to speak. We ask that for Delisa and myself. And uh, we pray, dear Father, that those who are trying to make it will make it. They cannot, then they can listen to the recording as it is being streamed live and it is being recorded. So bless our efforts again, we pray. We thank thee that we can do something for the kingdom at this time. So all we're trying to do there, Father, do our little bit to spread this message to every single grass in the field, one grass in the field, and prepare all, including ourselves, for thy second coming. We do ask these mercies, Lord, and we ask him on the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' blessed name, we do pray. Amen. Okay, family, we are going to uh, go through the study. Well, we're not going to take any questions again. So if you raise your hand, uh, I will not be able to acknowledge you. It's just that we don't have a crew here that can do that. So uh, let's begin. And let's go and look at, uh, as I remember, every single thing we go over in this study is in regards to the kingdom and answering what Pastor Carlton not said, that the premillennial kingdom is deadly heresy. His words, it's a product of fancy, his words. It has no basis in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, his words. You can go back and listen to that anytime you want in parts one and two. All right, let's see what the scriptures say. And then we'll be able to determine whether or not the premillennial kingdom is biblical or it is not. And then you'll have to decide at the end of this, these are uh, uh, in-depth investigation into the, uh, the kingdom, whether or not it's truth or not. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Okay, here, here we go. So let's get started. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentile shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Isn't this a beautiful scripture, family? Remember that when we go through these different verses and spirit of prophecy references, one of the best things that you can do at this particular point in time is just to, for this study, just listen to the entire study in its entirety. Don't try to write everything down because just look at how beautiful Isaiah 62 verses 1 and 3 is. 1 through 3, actually. You know, what, what wonder of divine love. The, the realization of the exceeding precious promise that God will continue speaking unto her until she becomes a great and powerful and resplendent light in all the world and a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord. The church is seen, we're family, standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. 
Let's go to Revelation 1-1 before we take a look at that any further. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. This affirmation that the prophetic events which John was privileged to record were to come to pass not before but shortly after his receiving the revelation of them shows that the prophecies of the revelation were to be fulfilled sometime during the New Testament period. Uh, as we had mentioned before, let's go and look at Revelation 14, 1 to 3, where we see the church standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. And I looked, and lo, a Lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his Father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Prior to this prophetic event, the standing of the hundred and forty four thousand on Mount Zion, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Let's turn to Revelation 5, 8, 11, and 12. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The Lamb standing at first before the throne in heaven stands later with the 144,000 on Mount Zion upon earth, though the elders and the beasts round about the throne remain in heaven. So correctly to understand this prophetic event in its entirety, we must carefully differentiate the part which takes place in heaven from the part which takes place on earth. Does that make sense? Okay, then let's do that. Let's do that. The seven lamps which we see in Revelation 4-5, being a part of the sanctuary fixtures, gives conclusive evidence that the heavenly throne scene occurs in the sanctuary whereas the subsequent Zion scene takes place on Mount Zion, the king's earthly palace grounds, not upon Mount Moriah, the sanctuary grounds where it would necessarily have to take place were it to denote that the events occurs in the sanctuary. The, these scenes, therefore, are of two different events in two different locations. The setting of the throne in heaven and the standing of the redeemed with the Lamb on earth while the activities embraced in the throne scene are still in progress. Moreover, 
the statement, I will show thee things which must be hereafter, places the events in the Christian period. And the statement stood a lamb as it had been slain, bleeding in the sinner's behalf, places them in probationary time. Then from a comparison of Daniel 7, 9, 10, 13, with Revelation 4, 2, and Revelation 5, 1, and 11, the, the fact is clear that both visions are of the same event, the judgment. The one reveals it occurring in the period of the nondescript B, second stage, after its horn, which had the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things, uh, had blasphemed after the reign of ecclesiastical Rome and before the beast was slain and his body given to the burning flame. We see that in Daniel 7, 11, before Rome's destruction. And the other vision reveals it taking place somewhere in the Christian period and within probationary time. So Daniel saw thrones cast down and the Ancient of Days, the judge, sit, showing that neither he nor the thrones were there before. Uh, evidently, on the rest of the throne seats sat the 24 elders. And finally, he saw the Son of Man, Christ, the advocate brought before the Ancient of Days. So accordingly, both Daniel and John saw the judgment set and the books opened. And, uh, and as John saw the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb after the judgment was set and before it was closed, the event consequently comes neither before nor after the judgment, but during the judgment. And now remember that John's vision of the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, we see that in Revelation 14.1 reveals Christ as a savior, whereas his vision of the line of the tribe of Judah standing before the judgment reveals him as a king. Correlated, they show that while he is then the savior, he's at the same time the king of kings. So it's now clear as to when the 144,000 emerge and increased interest follows as to who they are seeing that they are followers of the Lamb, Christians, also sons of Jacob, they're therefore Israelites indeed, and not Gentiles. Whosoever has been converted to Christianity, accepting Christ as his personal Savior, has had an experience which has completely overthrown and revolutionized his former plans and hopes his entire way of life. He's renounced the world and all its pleasures of sin for a season and has become a new creature in Christ, born again, heir of the kingdom according to the promise. This is what Christ meant when he declared to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. And Paul, having this experience in mind, says, if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, Galatians 3.29. Regardless of this, whether one be Jew or Gentile, he can have no part in the kingdom of Christ save through the second birth by which he becomes one of the seed of Abraham. This spiritual transformation nevertheless does not fix anyone's racial identity and tribal lineage. It cannot, in other words, make one Judite if he is not descended of Judah or make him Ephraimite if he is not descended of Ephraim. Consequently, the 144,000 being of the sons of Jacob cannot be of the Gentile nations. They therefore, first of all, are lineal descendants of Jacob, though not necessarily of the present identifiable Jewish stock. The ten tribes, the kingdom of Israel, were carried away, scattered throughout the cities of the Medes, 2 Kings 17.6, and so completely submerged in the sea of life of the surrounding nations and assimilated that they were uttering lost sight of racially to human reckoning. So similarly, as the two tribes, the kingdom of Judah, were carried away to Babylon, with only a few returning to Jerusalem after the 70 years of their captivity was accomplished, 
a multitude of them also lost their identity. Then, then too, the early Christian church was made up of Jews only, the apostles, the 120 in the upper room, Acts 115, and the 3,000 who were converted on the day of Pentecost, Acts 241, were all Jews, as were indeed virtually all those who were added daily for the first three and a half years after the crucifixion. We see that in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, and Acts 2, 47. And even after this period was over, and the apostles were commissioned to take the gospel to the Gentiles, Acts 13, 46, many more Jews became Christians and subsequently as Christians, rather than as Jews, were scattered among the nations. So, so clearly, therefore, in each instance, most of the sons of Jacob lost their racial distinctiveness. As the Lord, however, has ever kept the genealogies of all nations, especially of the sons of Jacob, he will, as he has promised, make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this man was born there. And of Zion it shall be said, This and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he rideth up the people that this man was born there. Selah. So just as obvious as strange is the fact that no one today but the recognized Jew can vouch for his ancestry with the result that the 144,000 can be gathered from almost every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and yet be of the sons of Jacob. Let's look at Isaiah 11, 11 and 12, and Isaiah 27, 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Sinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. Since therefore history, logic, and scripture combine their evidences to prove unconditionally that God has preserved the genealogy of the chosen branch of the human race forward from Adam to Noah, we see that in Matthew 1, 1 through 17, and backward from Jesus to Adam. We see that in Luke 3, 23 through 38. He must then for a consistent reason also have preserved the identity of the elect today. And we see this is precisely what he has done in his designating the lineage of the 144,000 as of all the tribes of the children of Israel. We see that in Revelation 7, 4. And although we do not know what we are and cannot ever of ourselves tell, the one who knows all about us even to the last hair of each head knows our precise ancestry. Although those of us who are to be gathered from the seed of Jacob are, says the prophet, as the sand of the sea, whereas comparatively speaking, the identifiable Jewish race of today is but a handful to the nations and therefore cannot today be the ones to whom apply the terms Israel, Ephraim, and Joseph. Now, going back for a moment to the historical approach to our subject, we recall that after Solomon's death, the Israelite nation, the 12 tribes, was divided into two separate kingdoms. We see that in 1 Kings 11, 11 and 12, and 1 Kings 12, 19 and 27. 
The ten tribe kingdom occupying the northern portion of the promised land was also called Israel, also Ephraim, and occasionally the house of Joseph. Why Israel? Because of its majority of tribes. Ephraim, Isaiah eleven thirteen, because its kings came from Ephraim, and Joseph, Ezekiel thirty seven sixteen, because he was the father of Ephraim. But the two tribe kingdom occupying the southern portion was called Judah because its kings were of the tribe of Judah, and therefore its descendants are called Jews. The term Israel, accordingly, often applies only to the ten tribes. So when from now on in these presentations you hear the terms Judah, Israel, Ephraim, and Joseph, you understand precisely who they're designating and will therefore, as we proceed, better understand God's plan for the ingathering of the 12 tribes of Israel and for reuniting them in one great kingdom. Christ said, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the ear come, and lodge in the branches thereof. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass, that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Hearing Christ's teachings, then rejecting them, and then crucifying him, the Jewish nation brought upon their heads the doom which God pronounced upon them when through his prophet he declared, Ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Th though at the same time, in his great mercy, he let the promise be written, in the place where it was said unto them, unto ancient Israel, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, unto ancient Israel, Ye are the sons of the living God. You see that in Romans 9, 24 through 26. So happily, family, the same people, Israel and Judah, who were set aside and scattered, will in that day, in our time, be reaccepted and gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land. Having existed many days without a king, their lot from the days of their captivity in Babylon even to this very day, the children of Israel afterward, sometime in the future, says the scripture, return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. But as David, the king of ancient Israel, had been dead for many years when this prophecy was made, and as it has never been fulfilled, he was the type of the David to come. Accordingly, it is those who fear the Lord and his goodness, the Christian Israelites in the latter days, our time, who shall appoint one head or king, the antitypical David. From, from these clear-cut facts, we see that the children of Israel, dispersed and without a king these many, many days, are to return, not as Jews, but as Christians. So this consolidation of the two ancient kingdoms, Judah and Israel, is seen in the symbolism of the two joint sticks. The Lord says, Thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it, for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it, for Joseph the stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, 
which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. Before we continue, so let me just say, before I continue reading, that if you remember, Pastor Knott said that the premillennial kingdom had no basis. Keep that in mind as we go through this, because it's very important that you, you keep that in mind. No biblical basis at all. A flight of fancy. Deadly heresy. So what we're doing here is we're building a foundation. I want you to keep listening very carefully and uh, write down what you need to write down, but listen very carefully as we're going to finish with Ezekiel 37, 16 through 25. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. This illustrated prophecy scarcely needs to be interpreted, as it's virtually self-explanatory showing that the two ancient kingdoms, Judah and Israel, will yet be gathered from among the heathen, among whom they have long been scattered, and that they will become one great nation again, a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Daniel 2.44. Look at verse 26, 27, and 28. Moreover, saith the Lord, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Since God says that he will multiply them when they again become a kingdom and that the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, and since he can neither multiply nor sanctify after the close of probation, the two ancient kingdoms must necessarily then be restored and consolidated during probation every time, the times of restitution. The 144,000 being the first fruits, there must therefore be second fruits. For where there's first, there must also be second. And as the first fruits are the service of God, they must subsequently be sent to all nations to gather the second fruits, which we see in Isaiah 66, 19 and 20, the great multitude, Revelation 7, 9, which John saw after viewing the ceiling of the 144,000. The fact that in their mouth was found no guile, Revelation 14, 5, 
plainly goes to show that they are to proclaim nothing but pure gospel truth and makes their words as authoritative and as mandatory as the written words of the prophets and of the apostles. Indeed, these first fruits are invested with even greater power and authority. Let's look at Zechariah 12, 8 and Zechariah 13, 1. We're going to find something interesting there. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. Also in that day, further says Zechariah, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. When this fountain for sin and for uncleanness is finally opened to the house of David, the crowning evidence will be seen that the consolidation of the two kingdoms is an accomplished fact and that the time has come for the proclamation of the gospel in the entire world. Let's look at Zechariah 13, 2 and Ezekiel 34, 23 and 24. And before we go there, just keep in mind that all of the scriptures that we're dealing with here are what Pastor Knott was utilizing, or many of them, as evidence that there's no premillennial kingdom. As a matter of fact, many of them he didn't even read. Okay, so keep that in mind because we're trying to rightly divide the word of truth. So let's go to Zechariah 13, 2 and Ezekiel 34, 23 and 24. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. That is, at the time this gospel proclaiming kingdom is set up, it will be a church without guile, free from all idolaters and false teachers, and it will be fed by one shepherd, even my servant David, he shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd and I the Lord will be their God and my servant David a prince among them. When the Lord consequently takes the reins in his own hands as we see in Testimonies to Ministers, page 300 and again rules the church as a theocratic government in the last days, We'll see this in Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4. It shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So with the ushering in of this everlasting kingdom and the consequent restitution of all things, there will be on one hand a great awakening among the nations, scrapping vast stores of war implements, which they have for years been laying up. They will seek to go up to and become subjects of the kingdom and to join the armies of the Lord, allowing him to fight for them. While on the other hand, there will be feverish war preparations among those who refuse to awaken, hurling all into a super armament program, they even turn their farm implements into weapons of war against the kingdom of Christ. His church, we see that in Joel 3, 9 through 12 and Zechariah 12, 3. Let's turn to Isaiah 60, verses 11 and 14. 
Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. But being far, very far, from such high and holy estate, the church must be purified. We all know this. No Christian of any faith can honestly deny the church's need of purification. And as the Lord never does anything without forewarning his church, he's now sending to her the message of purification in order to give her a foretaste of future glory so that as heaven's clarion call to reformation continues sounding forth among his people, they may have a keen relish for its truth and may give themselves wholeheartedly to the work of reform right now while, while he's clearly laying before them his plan for the setting up of his kingdom with consequent results to the sinners. Those who give implicit heed to the call will have an irresistible desire to come fully into line and to have the Lord separate them from sin and sinners. They alone will receive the seal of God. And as the first fruits of the kingdom, 144,000 strong, stand with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Such a state of holiness will today, just as in the past, cause a dragon to be wrought with a woman. Also now to make war with her remnant, as we see in Revelation 12, 17, a conflict which is further described in the words in Revelation 7, 1 through 3. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now remember, all of this has to do with the kingdom. I keep that in mind. I'm laying a foundation. Now let's take a look at what we just read. Okay, family. I want you to look at this chart very closely because I'm pretty sure that many of you have never seen this chart before. This is prophetic art, and it was drawn by Brother V.T. Hartuff, and uh, we just happened to color it. So let's talk about this from what we just read for a few minutes because here are brought to view two hurtings about to take place. One by the winds, the other by the angels, and two commands to the angels. One that they restrain the winds, that the winds don't blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree, Revelation 7, 1. The other that the angels restrain themselves from hurting the earth, sea, and the trees, till the servants of God are sealed. We see that in Revelation 7, Two and three. Since therefore, as soon as the servants of God are sealed, both the winds and the angels will begin to hurt, the question arises as to what the work of the winds and the work of the angels represent political strife or something else. Now, as the nations have always been at war, this twofold work of hurting could not represent political strife. And as Jesus says that at the time of the end, nation shall rise against nation and kingdoms against kingdom, Matthew 24, 7, it's clear that the hurting by the winds and the hurting by the angels, both of which are kept back until the 144,000 are sealed, must be figurative of holding back the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, Daniel 12, 1. 
Accordingly, God's restraining of the four winds is his holding back the image of the beast's activity against the saints. Revelation 13, 15 through 17, while his restraining the four angels that they hurt not, is his holding back the executing of his vengeance upon the sinners who trouble the church. Isaiah 63, 1 through 4, Jeremiah 51, 18, until after the sealing of the 144,000 is completed, being coupled, these two hurtings bring the time of trouble such as never was. Revelation 7, 1 to 3, therefore, reveals a twofold conflict, wicked men against God, the blowing of the winds, and God against them, the angels are hurting them. But though the blowing of the winds and the hurting of the angels after the servants of God are sealed will bring the time of trouble, yet every one that shall be found written in the book shall be delivered. Daniel 12, 1, praise God. So from these facts, we see that this time of trouble is held back in order to safeguard the sealing of the 144,000 servants in case they, the very elect, be brought down to worship the image of the beast or be killed for refusing. Since in Revelation all the books of the Bible meet and end, we find that in Acts of the Apostles, page 585, the sealing of the servants of God, Revelation 7, must necessarily be found also in the prophecies in Ezekiel, chapter 9 is envisioned the marking of those who sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof, in Judah and in Israel, and the slaughter of those who do not consequently sigh and cry. And the fact that God has at no time, at no time, taking the sinners from among the righteous in Judah and in Israel shows that this prophecy of purification by slaughter has never been fulfilled. So therefore, as the marking is the same as the sealing, the angel's slaying is the same as the angel's hurting. This hurting and sealing was John saw, and the slaughter and marking that Ezekiel saw are again identified as one and the same in Testimonies to Ministers, page 445, Testimonies, volume 5, page 211, and volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 267. Let's look at that. This sealing of the servants of God is the same that was shown to Ezekiel in vision. Although the marking and the slaughter in Ezekiel 9 include only the church, Judah, and Israel, the hurting by the winds and the hurting by the angels, Revelation 7, include the entire world, both the earth and the sea, each of which is indicative of a different locality. The sea in the realm of nature, this storehouse, home of the waters, is therefore in the realm of symbols, the birthplace of the nations, the old country. The earth, the opposite of the sea, is correspondingly a domain away from the old country. It's located to John in the symbol of the two horned beasts coming up not out of the sea, but out of the earth, Revelation 13, 11, the only place where trees naturally grow. And as according to Daniel 4, 20 through 22, trees are figurative of rulers. Therefore, the trees in this instance represents the ancient men before the house, Ezekiel 9, 6, a fact that reveals that in this period, the church's headquarters are in the two-horned beast domain, the new world, the earth. So family, in light of the clear-cut facts before us, we see that the main object of the sealing or marking of the service of God is to cleanse the church from sin and sinners so that she may be able to stand strong against the image beast in the time of trouble and that when this purifying work is completed, it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy 
even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. When this special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people, is accomplished, then the church is to enter upon her final conflict, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. She is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. That's from the Great Controversy, page 425, and Prophets and Kings, page 725. Let's go over to Isaiah 4, verses 5 and 6, and Isaiah 62, 12. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and upon her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from storm and from rain. Isaiah 62, 12, and they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Let's take a look at Testimonies, volume 8, page 47. The entire church, acting as one, blending in perfect union, is to be a living, active missionary agency moved and controlled by the Holy Spirit. All that the apostles did, every church member today is to do. His workers will then see eye to eye, and the arm of the Lord, the power of which was seen in the life of Christ, will be revealed. Then it shall come to pass, saith the Lord, what we read in Ezekiel 36, 23-33, that I will sanctify my great name which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanlinesses, and I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded. Again the servant of the Lord says in the Desired Ages, page 161, in cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission. First, to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earthly desires, the selfish lusts, 
the evil habits that corrupt the soul. And second, to cleanse the entire church from sin and sinners. As twice, once in the closing of John the Baptist's proclamation of the kingdom and in the opening of the gospel of dispensation at the beginning of Christ's ministry, and once at the close of his work and at the opening of the apostles. You find that in Special Testimonies to Ministers, number 7, page 54. He cleansed the temple from the unholy practices by which the Jews had desecrated it. You see that in John 2, 15 and 16, Matthew 21, 12 and 13. He thereby twice gave warning in type that also in the closing of the Christian dispensation, he will cleanse his church twice, once at the sealing of the first fruits, the 144,000, and again at the sealing of the second fruits, the great multitude, Revelation 7, 1 through 9. So since both of these cleansings, moreover, took place at the Feast of the Passover, and since, too, all who had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, you see in Second Chronicles 30, verse 3, and Exodus 12, 3 through 6, were forbidden to participate in the Passover in the first month, but were permitted to prepare for it and to celebrate it in the second month. Find that in Numbers chapters 9 through 11, Second Chronicles 30, verse 13. Thereby is typified the purification of the church in two sections, just showing still again that there are two gatherings, two ceilings, two separations, two companies, first fruits and second fruits. Says the spirit of prophecy, there must be a cleansing of the institution similar to Christ's cleansing of the temple of old. It is written, saith the Lord, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. There are in our institutions today transactions similar to those that took place in the temple courts in Christ's time, and all heaven is looking on. The Lord will work to purify his church. I tell you in truth, the Lord is about to turn and overturn in the institutions called by his name. Just how soon this refining process will begin, I cannot say, but it will not be long deferred. He whose fan is in his hand will cleanse his temple of its moral defilement. He will thoroughly purge his floor. In parabolic preview of the purification of the church, Christ declared, the angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Matthew 13, 49. In other words, take away the wicked and leave the good. Whereas in the Revelation addressing his own in Babylon, he says, come out of her, my people. Revelation 18, 4. Calling the righteous out and leaving the wicked in. The former are purified by the wicked's being cast out from among them, the latter by their being taken out from among the wicked. Also, the two distinct parables of the talents, Matthew 25, 15 through 30, and Luke 19, 13 through 27, both of which pointedly enter the picture in its present setting. In the one are three servants, in the other ten servants. This significant difference shows that the former has only a local application, whereas the latter has a worldwide application. Incidentally showing, as does the Shepherd Rod, volume 2, page 85 and 86, that in the scriptures, number 10 stands for universality, and number 3 for the Trinity and the Church. No, we're going to get a lot of questions on that. We will deal with that at that particular point in time. But moving on, these unalterable truths of type and parable and the word of his testimony bring us face to face with the solemn reality that we are come to the time of the antitypical Passover and cleansing of the temple and to the harvest of the world, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The spirit of prophecy bids us with awful solemnity 
get ready, get ready, get ready for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. His wrath is to be poured out unmixed with mercy and ye are not ready. Rend the heart and not the garment. Let no one be misled into thinking that after the close of probation or after the second coming of Christ, after the sinners in the world have been destroyed, God's church will attain to the exalted standard of character and to the high office of point of heaven and be purified from sin and sinners. On the contrary, family, in that day before the sinners in the world have been destroyed, the Lord says in Zechariah 12, verses 3, 8, and 9, and Zechariah 14, verses 20 through 21, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burdens themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seeth therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. These verses expressly declare that the church will be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them during the time of trouble when the nations will gather against her and the Lord in vengeance will then smite them. Probation still lingering while this sequence of events takes place. All they that sacrifice, an act which, by the way, is performed before the close of probation, will be holy, and there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord. Every true Bible student knows that the church must reach this purity of heart and character and position, not after but before Christ's mediatorial work is finished and before the sacrifice has ceased. All such students also know that God can neither manifest His great power to defend them in the time in which all the people of the earth gather together against them or bestow His Spirit upon them as He did upon the early Christians on the day of Pentecost if there are sinners among His people. And if the entire church be not with one accord, as in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, fear as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as the army with banners, as was the apostolic church upon which the Spirit descended as a rushing mighty wind, as in Acts 2, verse 2. Let's follow up with this in review in Herald, November 19, 1908. The Spirit of Prophecy says, Only those who have withstood and overcome temptation through the strength of the Mighty One will be permitted to act a part in proclaiming this message when it shall have swelled into the loud cry. And that the loud cry fail not to sound on time or at all, those who do not overcome, those who had betrayed their trust, the ancient men, those whom God had given great light and who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people must be removed. This is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of the men each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. Men, maidens, and little children all perished together. Confronted with the towering certainty of the church's eminent purification, sealing, and subsequent glory, we hasten to face the church's condition just before the purification. What greater deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they are right when they are all wrong? 
the message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception, yet honest in that deception. They know not that their condition is deplorable in the sight of God, while those addressed are flattering themselves that they are in an exalted spiritual condition. The message of the true witness breaks their security by the startling denunciation of their true condition of spiritual blindness, poverty, and wretchedness. The testimony, so cutting and severe, cannot be a mistake, for it is the true witness who speaks, and his testimony must be correct. Let's go to volume eight. Page 250. Who can truthfully say our goal is tried in the fire? Our garments are unspotted by the world? I saw our instructor pointing to the garments of so-called righteousness. Stripping them off, he laid bare the defilement beneath. Then he said to me, can you not see how they have pretentiously covered up their defilement and rottenness of character? How is the faithful city becoming harlot? My father's house is made a house of merchandise, a place whence the divine presence and glory have departed. For this cause, there is weakness and strength is lacking. The ancient men those to whom God had given great light and who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people had betrayed their trust. These dumb dogs that would not bark are the ones who feel the just vengeance of an offended God. Men, maidens, and little children all perish together. Let's go over the Testimonies, Volume 3, page 253. It is difficult for those who feel secure in their attainments and who believe themselves to be rich in spiritual knowledge to receive the message which declares that they are deceived and in need of every spiritual grace. The unsanctified heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. These are quite revealing testimonies. Let's go to pages 270 and 272. We're going to continue on. There are many who do not have the discretion of Joshua and who have no special duty to search out wrongs and to deal promptly with the sins existing among them. Let not such hinder those who have the burden of this work upon them. Let them not stand in the way of those who have this duty to do. Some make it a point to question and doubt and find fault because others do the work that God has not laid upon themselves. These stand directly in the way to hinder those upon whom God has laid the burden of reproving and correcting prevailing sins, that his frown may be turned away from his people. Should a case like Achan's be among us, there are many who would accuse those who might act the part of Joshua in searching out the wrong of having a wicked, fault-finding spirit. God is not to be trifled with and his warnings disregarded with impunity by a perverse people. God's displeasure is upon his people and he will not manifest his power in the midst of them while sins exist among them and are fostered by those in responsible positions. Continuing with the same reading. Those who work in the fear of God to rid the church of hindrances and to correct grievous wrongs that the people of God may see the necessity of abhorring sin and may prosper in purity and that the name of God may be glorified will ever meet with resisting influences from the unconsecrated. Zephaniah thus describes the true state of this class and the terrible judgments that will come upon them. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees 
that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. Not finished with volume three yet. When a crisis finally comes, as it surely will, and God speaks in behalf of his people, those who have sinned, those who have been a cloud of darkness, and who have stood directly in the way of God's working for his people, may become alarmed at the length they have gone in murmuring and in bringing discouragement upon the cause. And like Achan, becoming terrified, they may acknowledge that they have sinned, but their confessions are too late and are not of the right kind to benefit themselves, although they may relieve the cause of God. Those who have been nearly all their lives controlled by a spirit as foreign to the spirit of God as was Achan's will be very passive when the time comes for decided action on the part of all. They will not claim to be on either side. These readings are all over the spirit of prophecy, telling us why uh, the condition the church is going to be in before the purification. Let's go to volume 5, page 80 and 81. We have been inclined to think that where there are no faithful ministers, there can be no true Christians. But this is not the case. God has promised that where the shepherds are not true, he will take charge of the flock himself. God has never made the flock wholly dependent upon human instrumentalities. But the days of purification of the church are hastening on apace. God will have a people pure and true. In the mighty sifting soon to take place, we shall be better able to measure the strength of Israel. The signs reveal that the time is near when the Lord will manifest that his fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor. Those who have trusted to intellect, genius, or talent will not then stand at the head of rank and file. They did not keep pace with the light. Those who have proved themselves unfaithful will not then be entrusted with the flock. In the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. They are self-sufficient, independent of God, and he cannot use them. The Lord has faithful servants who in the shaking, testing time will be disclosed to view. There are precious ones now hidden who have not bowed the knee to Baal. They have not had the light which has been shining in a concentrated blaze upon you, but it may be under a rough and uninviting exterior, the pure brightness of a genuine Christian character will be revealed. The foregoing series of statements shows that the church must be cleansed before the rest of God's people are gathered out of all countries. Let's turn to Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Then, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. But to be delivered from captivity and to hear the Lord plead there for his people, we dare not now spurn his pleadings. Let's turn to Jeremiah 3, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 18. They say, If a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord? Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, 
and see where thou hast not been lean with. In the ways hast thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refuseth to be ashamed. Will thou not from this time cry unto me, My father, thou art the guide of my youth? Let's continue. Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city, and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. Let's continue on. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imaginations of their evil hearts. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. Let's turn to Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. How be it, saith the Lord, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Let's look at Malachi 3 verses 1 through 18. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow, and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Let's continue. Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. 
Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pull you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and ye shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Let's continue. Malachi has some more to say. Ye have said, it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Let's turn to Isaiah 28, verses 16 through 23. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. From the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. For the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch himself on it and the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Let's continue in Isaiah. Now therefore be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption, even determined upon the whole earth. Give ye ear, and hear my voice. Hearken, and hear my speech. As God has promised that where the shepherds are not true, he will take charge of the flock himself. We find that in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 80, Testimonies to Ministers, page 300, and Jeremiah 317. And as the descendants of Jacob again become a kingdom, appoint to themselves one head, as we see in Hosea 111, David their king in Hosea 3, 5, and see the Lord their God, it's evident that the church in the time of the loud cry of the third angel's message will be a theocracy. Let's look at Genesis 49, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. 
and a man shall be as an hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord sent a word into Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. Behold, the Lord will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Let's go to Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 5. I never get tired of hearing God's word. And that's what we go by. It is written. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Prophesies Isaiah in figurative depiction of this glorious triumph of God's purpose and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Let's go to the next slide. In this illustration, there are three persons brought to view. Jesse, the father of David, the rod, David, and the branch, Christ. The relationship shows that David the rod is not Christ the branch because the rod sprang from the stem of Jesse and the branch from the rod. A fact which is borne out in the cry of the multitude when Christ entered Jerusalem. They shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, Matthew twenty-one fifteen. So plainly the rod coming from the stem of Jesse is symbolic of David. And the branch coming from the rod is symbolic of the son of David, Christ. Upon this ensign, branch and rod, the spirit of the Lord shall rest, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. So though the ensign emblematizes the connection of three persons, Jesse the root, David the rod, and Christ the branch, yet the power and wisdom of Christ is its underlying and controlling force. Wherefore Christ says, 
in Revelation 22, 16, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star, bearing out that he is all and in all. Since therefore from the stem of Jesse came the rod, David, and from the rod sprang the branch, Christ, David the visible king, and Christ the invisible king of kings shall in that day in our time constitute the ensign, and to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest or his resting place, the location where the rod or ensign stands, the kingdom, shall be glorious. Yea, I will make the place of my feet glorious, Isaiah 60, 13, says the Lord. Let's look at Ezekiel 34, verses 23 through 25. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make with them a covenant of peace, and will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. So his church or kingdom is again reflected without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, as in Ephesians 5.27, a theocracy of peace, safety, and invincibility under the rule of one shepherd and a king, David his servant. But the fact that many kings reigned over Israel may in the minds of some give rise to the question, why David a type? Inevitably, because he is the only one who perfectly fits the antitype, the leadership in the time of the loud cry of the third angel's message. This being so, then it necessarily follows that Saul, the first king who reigned over Israel and who was largely responsible for the early experience of David's life is a type of the church leadership in the period before the loud cry, the leadership which was raised up in 1844 and for the sole purpose of gathering the 144,000, the first fruits of the kingdom. In each case, type perfectly matches antitype. On account of his outwardly kingly appearance, Saul was chosen by the people, as you will remember, to be their king, in spite of God's disapproval. You see that in 1 Samuel 8, verse 7. Then finally, when God rejected him and anointed David to be king in his stead, he was determined to retain the throne by attempting to kill David, but ended up even before David ascended to the throne by deliberately killing himself. You see that in 1 Samuel 31 verse 4. Time has already demonstrated that the SDA organization is fulfilling the type preferring to incorporate and to elect officers by the people's vote, they have thereby manifested that they have cared not so much to please God by being a peculiar people as he would have them to be, as they have to please themselves by being as much as possible like the other denominations. Just as in Saul's time, the people wanted to be like the nations around them. You see that in 1 Samuel 8 verses 5 and 7. And although chosen by the people, yet the general conference officers were nevertheless accepted by God to be the rulers over his people now as Saul was anciently. Just as he betrayed his trust by disobeying the word of God as spoken to him by the prophet Samuel, so the present church organization, the ancient men before the house, have, says the prophet to the church today, betrayed their trust. You see that in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 211. Speaking to the SDA leadership, the servant of the Lord says, You have no right to manage unless you manage in God's order. Are you under the control of God? Do you see your responsibility to Him? That these men should stand in a sacred place to be as the voice of God to the people, as we once believed the general conference to be. 
that is past. What we want now is reorganization. We find that in General Conference Bulletin, 34th Session, Volume 4, Extra Number 1, April 3rd, 1901, page 25, columns 1 and 2. This revelatory statement conclusively proves that after the historical Minneapolis meeting in 1888, when the leaders rejected both the message and the counsel which was given them, you see that in Testimonies and Ministers, page 468, the Lord did not any longer regard the general conference as his servants, just as he did not any longer regard Saul as king over Israel after he turned from the Lord's commands to him. And now, having long since granted the popular demand to organize a general conference, in fulfillment of the time, God warns that his forbearance has come to an end today, just as it did then. Solemnly declares the spirit of prophecy in Christ Our Righteousness, page 154. God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more abhorrent to the Lord until he will refuse to acknowledge them as his children. A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits, and practices. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the Spirit. Revival and Reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this work, they must blend. As Saul's fall came from neglecting to obey to the letter the word of the Lord, and from then excusing his disobedience under the pretext that he had speared the best of the camel for sacrificing in worship to God, so the present leadership although commanded to shun all worldly connections and ways and to avoid all manner of business on the Sabbath, such as selling literature, raising goals, etc., nevertheless disobediently connected with the world and followed in forbidden paths, even to turning the house of God into a house of merchandise. You see that in Testimonies, volume 8, page 250. Then continuing in Saul-like fashion, they pleaded extenuation of this disobedience and desecrating course on the grounds that such a practice is good missionary work. But says the spirit of prophecy in Testimonies, volume 1, page 471 and 472, a great mistake has been made by some who profess present truth by introducing merchandise in the course of a series of meetings and by their traffic diverting minds from the object of the meetings. If Christ were now upon earth, he would drive out these peddlers and traffickers, whether they be ministers or people, with a scourge of small cords, as when he entered the temple anciently and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. These traffickers might have pleaded as an excuse that the articles they held for sale were for sacrificial offerings, but their object was to get gain, to obtain means to accumulate. I was shown that if the moral and intellectual faculties had not been clouded by wrong habits of living, ministers and people would have been quick to discern the evil results of mixing sacred and common things. 
ministers have stood in the desk and preached a most solemn discourse. And then by introducing merchandise and acting the part of a salesman, even in the house of God, they have diverted the minds of their hearers from the impressions received and destroyed the fruit of their labor. Though acknowledging Samuel as God's prophet, Saul at the same time deliberately disobeyed his words. Likewise, though also acknowledging Sister White as God's servant, the general conference sad to say, are today by the course they pursue denying her authority. This wide open fact is exposed numerous times in the spirit of prophecy, a representative statement being Testimonies, Volume 5, page 80. Those who have trusted to intellect, genius, or talent will not then, after the purification, stand at the head of rank and file. They did not keep pace with the light. They are self-sufficient, independent of God, and He cannot use them. The Lord has faithful servants who in the shaking, testing time will be disclosed to view. If they continue in this state, God will reject them. Just as Saul's outward show consequently resulted only in his being dethroned by another king, so likewise will the great men of today, those who are at the head of the work and who trust to intellect, genius, or talent be replaced by those who, though not having a polished outward appearance, are to be disclosed to view at this time as revealing the pure brightness of a genuine Christian character. As Saul furthermore defied God by refusing to abdicate the throne and by seeking the life of his anointed King David. So now at the sounding of the trumpet today, we find the general conference refusing to let God take the reins in his own hands. You see that claim of testimony from Ministers, page 300? They're attempting to usurp his throne by determining that they are to rule the denomination until the end of this world, and they're availing themselves of every chance to cast us out of their midst in order to safeguard their control of it. Those who are doing this are they whom the prophet Ezekiel prophetically heard saying, this city is the cauldron, and we be the flesh. They are now doing everything possible to exalt and to perpetuate themselves in power and to be rid of those who have in the name of the Lord published peace and brought to them good tidings that the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. But this city shall not, says the Lord, be your cauldron, neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst thereof, but I will judge you in the border of Israel. Those who desire to know the truth for themselves as to what kind of treatment we received at the hands of the church officials, as did David at the hands of Saul, we read our track number seven. Count the evidences on both sides before firing for or against. So firmly, in rejecting the message which has come to them with warnings and reproofs and in continuing in their evil ways, our brethren are compelling the Lord to cut them down by the slaughter weapons of Ezekiel 9 uh, unless they repent immediately. They want the way to suicide with soul, yet they are saying in their heart exactly what we see in volume 5, page 211. The Lord will not do good neither will he do evil. He is too merciful to visit his people in judgment. Thus, peace and safety is the cry from men who will never again lift up their voice like a trumpet to show God's people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. These dumb dogs that would not bark are the ones who feel the just vengeance of an offended God. Men maidens and little children all perished together. As Saul still further was responsible for the death, not only of his sons, but also of the people 
In 1 Samuel 31, 6, you see that. So the ministry will be responsible for the men, maidens, and little children who fail to receive the seal and who consequently perish in the slaughter. Nevertheless, despite their great sin and certain doom, David the type reveals the fact that though we may cut the skirt of their robes while they are bitter and wroth against us and are chasing us around the sheep coats, 1 Samuel 24, 3 and 4, or that we may take the spear and the cruise of water from their bolster while they're deep in sleep from the Lord, or that we may, as we find them asleep within the trench or covering their feet in our hiding place, 1 Samuel 26, 7 through 12, have them at our mercy with the power and the opportunity to do them much harm. Yet in no case would we hurt them in the least, but rather would befriend them. And while they're persecuting us, as Saul persecuted David, everyone that is in distress and everyone that is in debt and everyone that is discontent will, as the type also shows, join us. 1 Samuel 22, 2. Whereas all who are neither cold nor hot, lukewarm, satisfied, are with the angel of the church of the Laodiceans in critical danger of remaining wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked and of being as a consequence spewed out, rejected, cut down. You see that all through the testimony, volume 6, page 427, volume 5, page 80, which we've read, volume 1, page 190, volume 5, page 211, which we read, right on this page. So in the foregoing exposition, we see that those who respond to the Good Shepherd's voice are typified by David's followers, and those who do not respond are typified by Saul and his followers. In Luke's parable of the Great Supper, Christ again brings to view both classes. On the one hand, Saul sympathizes prefigure in the parable those who excuse themselves on the grounds that they were too busy with the cares of this life and who consequently, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first saying unto him, I have bought a piece of ground that I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. On the other hand, David's followers typified those who were found in the streets and lanes of the city, the poor and the maimed, and the halt and the blind. Immediately after Saul was informed by Samuel that because of his unfaithfulness, God had rejected him as ruler over his people, Samuel was sent secretly to anoint David to reign in Saul's stead. And though Saul was told that the Lord had rejected him, yet he refused to abdicate, with the result that the Philistines were besetting his army and were about to take the kingdom. The giant Goliath had stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him, and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Though nothing but a stripling despised by his brothers and but lowly regarded by all others, David said to Saul in 1 Samuel 17, 32, 40, 49 through 51, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had, even in a script 
and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine, and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran, and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. David's victory over the giant against whom no one was able to make war typifies the victory of the church, the house of David, which we see in Zechariah 12, 8, in the time of trouble such as never was over the beast and his image antitypical Goliath, concerning whose formidableness the revelator asks, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The giant Goliath, accordingly, represents those who now defy the servants of God and who will comprise the image of the beast, that religio-political system which will defy the armies of the Lord and issue a decree which we see in Revelation 13, 17, and 15, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. But in that day, saith the Lord, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. The five smooth stones in David's bag, with one of which he slew Goliath, typify the fivefold power in the antitypical shepherd's bag, the Bible, with one part of which God will today smite the beast at his image, the nations, the antitypical Goliath. And since we knew that it is by his word in the form of a message that he will smite the nations, then obviously the five smooth stones represent five messages, the last of which is to wound the beast destroy his image, and free God's people from the fear of the heathen. So as the five stones in the shepherd's bag are figurative of five messages, the messages therefore are necessarily scheduled somewhere in the Bible. Take a look at this chart. This is also prophetic art, and this chart is more than likely going to be new to many of you. Let's look at the five messages that are documented in the scriptures. They are in Christ's parable of the vineyard, the first at the early hour, the ceremonial system, the second at the third hour, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, the third at the sixth hour, the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14, the fourth at the ninth hour, the judgment of the dead, and the fifth and last at the eleventh hour, the judgment of the living the time of the loud cry, which will wound the beast, and with his own sword, the ten horns of Revelation 17, 16, cut off his head, and then with fire destroy him, so that the wound will never again heal. In the message of the hour, therefore lies the safety of God's people. Proclaiming the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Malachi 4, 5, a day of slaughter, Isaiah 30, 25, and a day of darkness, Joel 2.2. 2. This last message is to be sounded at the 11th hour, just before the time in which, as John foresaw, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, 
fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Number the righteous, the future leaders of the church as David's reign typifies. Look at Isaiah 42, verses 2, 3, and 25. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, Call him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings? He gave them as the dust to his sword, and as driven stubble to his bowl. He pursued them, and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun shall he call upon my name, and he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth clay. Let's go to Isaiah 55, verses 4 through 6. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Since for God to honor and for the prosperity of his people, both Elijah's message and David's reign took the lives of many, Elijah's message the lives of the apostate teachers in Israel, 1 Kings 18.40, and David's reign the lives of the heathen who defied God and his armies, 1 Chronicles 22, 6 through 8. Therefore, the work of Elijah particularly typifies the day of slaughter in the church and the reign of David, the destruction of the heathen and the possession of the earth. You see that in Zechariah 12, verses 8 and 9, Jeremiah 30, verses 3 and 9. Whereupon Christ, the son of David, will visibly appear, take upon himself his kingdom, you see that in Luke 19, 15, and glorify it with everlasting peace as typified by the peaceful reign of David's son Solomon. And in the days of these antitypical events will be completely realized the promise. In 1 Chronicles 17, 11 through 13, and it shall come to pass when thy days be expired that thou, that's David, must go to be with thy father, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me an house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him, as I took it from him that was before thee. And in Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. While to the righteous he makes the kingdom his place and protection, to the heathen God makes it his battle axe. Okay, family, we're going to stop here today. We've given you a lot. And believe me, we're just scratching the surface. When Pastor Knott takes an hour to go over a subject such as this, this subject is extensive. It's not just found in one place, in one scripture, a few spirit of prophecy quotations that seem to be refuting what the scriptures say and being taken out of the context that they're in. These, this is a massive subject. The harvest, Ezekiel 9, the, the latter rain. Uh, the, these are all subjects that Pastor not deals with. It says that, the uh, shepherd's rod message doesn't understand and has no comprehension of. So when we go through these studies and we give you scripture, and then we we deal with, the, with what the message says about what the rod message says about it, you've got to go back and say, is this accurate? Is this within context? And that's what we're doing. So we're going to continue next week with um, part four of the kingdom and uh, be able to give you more substantiated scriptural evidence that without the shadow of a doubt, 
without a shadow of a doubt, shows you that the premillennial kingdom is actually scriptural and that the, that's coming, coming real soon. So well, again, if you have questions, make sure you write down the slide. We'll have this uh, recording up on YouTube uh, by at least by tomorrow, if not by Monday. Uh, we, we'll see exactly what we have to do with it. But uh, make sure that you go and listen to it and go back because we went over a lot of stuff. So a lot of information, don't want to call it stuff, uh, information, scriptural and biblical information. So uh, let's have a word of prayer because we have to go to another engagement that we have. And many of you are invited. If you know where that is, you can come. It's not um, blocked off for anyone. But let's uh, thank the Lord for uh, in being with us today as we go over his word and as we all rightly divide the word of truth. Dear Father in heaven, how thankful we are for the opportunity to study thy word and to be able to rightly divide the truth, to be able to see and hear what it is you are saying to us in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. We look forward, dear Father, to not only learning more, but we're open to learn more because we know that this uh, plan of salvation is progressive and you give us what we can handle when we can handle. So help all your people here to go back, study for themselves, look at parts one and two, which is necessary to understand where we're going from here and be able to hear and see what Pastor Knox says and has said and hear and see what we are presenting here. We again, thank you there, Father, for all that you are doing for us and all that you are going to do and in the process of preparing for us. Let us be open to your word and to the progression it makes as you unroll the scroll. Bless all who came and all who are going to listen to the videos afterwards. And we thank thee again for what you're doing. We do ask these mercies, Lord. We ask them under the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' blessed name we do pray. Amen.